Welcome back to the Super Data Science Podcast, everybody. Super excited to have you back on the show. And today we've got a very special guest, Margot Gerritsen, calling in from California. How are you going, Margot? I'm, I'm doing well, Kirill. Yeah, thanks for having me on. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for coming on and for pronouncing my name correctly. <laughs> I try, uh, I try. <laughs> the, the original pronunciation. Um, it's great to have you. And uh, it's although it's unfortunate you mentioned you're, you, you were evacuated right now, right? You're in an evacuation. Well, we're back, but we were evacuated. Yeah, the fires yeah. here this year have been, been uh, t- tremendously bad, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, it starts a bit. It started a bit earlier than last year. No, like last year was yeah. In December. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, we've had uh, later and later actually in the year. Mm. Fight that these wildland later. fires come, and so mm. October, November is not unusual now, and that that's mm. the scary part because now we're you know it started the sixteenth of August mm. uh, here with these big fires because of a huge lightning storm that we had uh, coming through Central California. And um, and we've had these fires now for a month, uh, mm-hmm. but we still have probably the worst to come. And okay. so it's terrible. Wow. We, we have over, uh, I don't know how many square miles have been burned. I don't even want to think about it. It's terrible. That's, that's it's it's the worst year. It's the worst year. Yeah. Wow. So right now the air quality outside is 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 really bad. We're at, uh, if, if the AQI uh, means anything to you, we're, we're at 300 here, which is wow. hazardous. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, but uh, other than that, California is still amazing, <laughs> <laughs> right? That's yeah. uh, we still we still like the state, but uh, it's sad. Yeah. And uh, originally, you're from the Netherlands. Yeah. Uh, or is it? What's the difference between? And then that's part of my ignorance. If if this may be like the incorrect way of saying it, in Netherlands versus Holland, like what's uh, when do you use which word? I use both. I'm not so yes. sensitive to that, but there are some people, some Dutchies that uh, that yeah. really want you to say the Netherlands. And the yeah. reason is that Holland really is only two of our eleven, I think, provinces. Provinces. So, uh-huh. so you know, we the the country is divided in provinces, and there's two north and south Holland that uh-huh. uh, really are sort of the center of the country in terms uh-huh. of uh, the economy, and the most people live there, and so on. But of course, the other provinces don't like it when you refer to yeah. the whole country as just those two. But most people don't know, right? <laughs> what the difference is. So I'm not sensitive. And and, this, and when we, uh, you know, we're big soccer fans, and mm. and and we we talk about uh, about Holland, uh, the, the the big uh, cheer that we have for for soccer is "Hup Holland Hup," which means mm. "Come on, Holland." You know, come on. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. we don't use the Netherlands. And Holland is a lot uh, shorter, right, than the Netherlands. That yeah, just yeah. is a little gotcha. bit easier to roll off the tongue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, orange, right, is the national color. That's right. Yeah. Red, yeah. white, and blue and, and orange. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you still have a monarchy in Holland. In we do. We have a king. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's unusual to think about it. That, like, usually just think about the UK has a queen. But it's interesting that some kind of, like Spain also has a monarch still. Uh, yeah. Mo- Belgium. Has- yeah. Belgium. Yeah. Belgium. Wow. You know, and and of course some of the Scandinavian countries, right? So there's yeah, there's still quite a few. But uh, wow. I don't think in in Holland, uh, you know, the the king and and then formerly the queen uh, played such a big role. I never really thought about it as a uh-huh. as a as a kingdom in that sense. Uh, I'm yeah. Not a not a big fan, but maybe I shouldn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting just interesting um, yeah yeah okay all right also well um and you've had a very interesting life just from like what we discussed before the the start of the podcast briefly like you lived in new zealand for five years now you live in california originally from the netherlands tell us a bit about like how how did you end up being all over the world like that uh, by accident yeah wow. <laughs> it wasn't really planned i often uh, tell my students that the only thing that was planned in my life was that from a very young age on i wanted to leave the country i think i was uh-huh. eight when i wrote uh-huh. in my diary wow. hey i, d- I don't want to stay here i want to i want to go west 
Well, no, maybe because I, I, I was a big fan uh, of Led Zeppelin and they had the song uh, <laughs> California, going to California, right? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and then I, I remember when I was pretty young, I watched the movie The Graduate and, and I saw Dustin Hoffman drive across mm-hmm. the Bay Bridge, which I actually thought was the Golden Gate Bridge. And I thought, I want to do this, you know, drive yeah. across that amazing, iconic yeah. bridge in a convertible. So so that got me going. So both of them thought, well, California would be amazing. But I really just wanted to leave. You know, if, if you've spent any time in, uh, in, in northwestern Europe in the winter, yeah. you know why. Because it's gray and it's uh, mm-hmm. depressing. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. uh, and, and Holland is very flat. I wanted to see mountains and I wanted to have more sunshine. So, mm. so I left uh, uh, as soon as it was possible, which was really after my studies. And uh, mm-hmm. And I got a scholarship to go to any somewhere in the world. And I decided to go to the opposite of Holland, which was Colorado, because there uh, the number of days of sunshine was about the same as the number of days of, of cloudy <laughs> cloudiness <laughs> in Holland. Oh, wow. And they're big, big mountains, right? And it's not flat. So I thought, okay, this yeah. is it. This is this is what I have to experience. And then yeah. Uh, after a year there, I got into Stanford. I applied to Stanford and I moved to California. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, got this job in New Zealand and I thought, oh, let's try that out. And absolutely loved being there for five years and then got an offer to come back to Stanford, which was totally unexpected. So I just jumped uh, jumped on it. So, yeah, if, if you told me as an 18-year-old or so, hey, you're going to end up being on a podcast run by somebody in, the, in Australia while living in, in, in California, would have said you're, you're absolutely <laughs> out, of, out of your mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been, I've been so lucky. And yeah, yeah also, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. And... Um, lovely places colorado california and new zealand it's uh fantastic fantastic that uh, you've uh, experienced these and um what was from all your travels what was your most like memorable moment i don't know all, all my tra- all my yeah. travel oh well the best travel for me ever was going to antarctica mm. and so i never lived wow. there but i spent some time there and and the reason why this was so so fun for me is, uh, you know, I have one, I have a son. He's he's almost twenty one now, but um, mm-hmm. he was born in the year two thousand on January eleventh, mm-hmm. and and I said to him when he was about seven, you're going to have one really really special birthday because you're going to be turning eleven on January eleven mm-hmm. in two thousand eleven, and I thought mm-hmm. that was kind of kind of special. And so uh, when he was seven, I said to him, what do you want to do on this really, really special birthday? And he was a big fan of penguins at the time. So he said, mom, I want to celebrate my birthday with a lot of penguins. (laughs) And so so I said, we traveled a lot, uh, my son and I. I was a a single mom for for some time. And um, uh, and I said to him, you know what? I'm going to take you to celebrate your birthday with 25,000 penguins uh, oh, wow. on, on January 11, 2011. So I started saving up for a trip to Antarctica, and, the, and that's where we went. And on his birthday, he was uh, on land in Antarctica amidst a penguin colony of oh, at wow. least 25,000 penguins with a cake, and we celebrated his 11th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's so. That's, uh, yeah, the most amazing story I've heard about uh, travel or penguins. Wow, that's so cool! You're such a great mom. Yeah, well, that was that was fun. I hope. Uh, yeah, and you know, the, the good thing is to do this when when the kid is a little bit older, so they actually remember, right? Anything yeah. that we did before the age of six, he will have forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm sure this he will he will remember. So wow, yeah. that's awesome! That great. That's awesome. Hey everybody, hope you're enjoying this amazing episode and we've got a quick announcement and we'll get straight back to it. And the announcement is that Data Science Go Virtual number two is in town. It's happening on October 24th, 25th this year and you can get your tickets today at datasciencego.com slash virtual. And the best part, it's absolutely free. We've got some amazing speakers amazing workshops for you to attend. And of course, the super cool part is that we've got networking. There'll be several 30 minute speed networking sessions where for three minutes you connect with a random data scientist from another part of the world or maybe from your part of the world 
you get to chat for three minutes. If you like each other, if you want to connect, you hit the connect button, you stay in touch. This was by far one of the top features of Data Science Go virtual number one. So many people got such great connections, stayed in touch, and some crazy stories came out of that. So we're gonna repeat it, and we want you to connect with your fellow data scientists. Once again, it's absolutely free. Register for your ticket today at datasciencego.com slash virtual. And I'll see you there. And now let's get back to this episode. Okay, fantastic. Well, when you're not um, uh, a mom, you are a, a professor and a senior associate dean at Stanford. Tell us a bit about that. Well, that uh, sounds like a quite a... Um, responsible, important position at one of the world's top universities. Tell us oh, what you do in Stanford. Oh, oh yes, yeah, very, very important. <laughs> 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 well, it's mostly just a lot of fun. And in fact, I just stepped down as uh, as senior associate dean. Uh, I, I've, I've been really lucky that for about uh, 12 years or so, I was able to, to have some leadership positions on campus and uh, my favorite one probably was uh, directing uh, an institute of computational mathematics at Stanford University and mm -hmm. I liked it uh, particularly because uh, uh, I could work with all of the graduate students and that's the biggest joy right that's why I'm at university is to work with young students you know they mm -hmm. they keep me young and then they're mm -hmm. idealistic and they're excited and they're super smart and Oh, it's uh, just a dream to work with them and and to help them on their way. You know, it's uh, it's one of uh, the big privileges in my life, um, and I love teaching. So so that's uh, been great fun. Um, and yeah, as associate dean, uh, it was we had a great team uh, of of people working on what we call educational affairs. So again, really thinking about the teaching experience and the learning experience in in our school. Uh, mm -hmm. So and in Stanford, yeah, it's a great place. It's also, uh, as you said, it's 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 a good university, and so they expect quite a bit from you. Uh, mm -hmm. My life now, I'm full professor, so that means that you've been through every single promotion, right? Mm -hmm. And wow. my life now is a lot nicer than it was <laughs> when I first started my career, because then there is a lot of pressure on you, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of, uh, you know, for most people, I think, uh, stress associated with that. Yeah, but yeah, now I've good. now I've got the life of Riley, right? As they say, it doesn't get any any better than this. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, and uh, what what uh, subject do you teach as full professor? So I really love teaching uh, computational mathematics, and mm -hmm. my favorite course I'm actually teaching uh, starting on Monday. That's mm -hmm. linear algebra. And mm. a lot of people think, well, well, why, why that? But you know, it's really the the building block of almost everything that people do. And of course, for data science, you know, anything that you do computationally, linear algebra really is the foundation. And mm -hmm. so that's why I uh, I love it so much. And it's a it's a wonderful course that I'm teaching for beginning graduate students. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so it's wonderful to show them that even with only one quarter of, of this material, they can, they can do so much with that. They can understand principal component analysis. They, of course, understand regression. You know, there is so much that they can do uh, mm -hmm. with this. And um, so that's probably my very favorite class, but I also teach classes in energy systems, particularly renewable energy. I'm a big fan of fluid dynamics. I did that for a long time, you know, uh, simulation of fluid flows and I'm really excited about wind turbines that must be my Dutch heritage <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean we have had wind turbines for centuries right and we uh, have a, yeah. a, a windmill in the village where I grew up and and I always thought they were beautiful machines and uh, uh -huh. and so I like teaching about that and explaining how they work and uh so that's that's a lot of fun, and I've been teaching some courses in the in the in my distant past in in fluid mechanics, which I also really really love. So, yeah, you know, a little bit of everything. I try to teach uh, new courses uh, uh, frequently because when mm -hmm. you're teaching something, you're really learning the material. Yeah. So sometimes when I think, oh, I don't really know this well enough or that well enough, I just volunteer to teach, and then. The shame factor kicks in, and I got it. <laughs> I got to really understand it faster than my students, right? So yeah. I'm on this learning curve, and I just find that very exciting. Hmm. Gotcha. Um, for someone who is listening and uh, 
uh, maybe he's coming into the field of data science from a different field, non less technical field. Uh, how would you characterize or how would you explain what linear algebra is? How does it differ to just, um, I don't know, like um, calculus, for example? Like what is linear algebra? You know, Kirill, it really depends on what area they come in from. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the interesting thing about linear algebra, as I said, it is a foundation of, of many, many uh, different areas in engineering and also the sciences. Um, but for most people who are looking into data science, linear algebra comes in because data is typically stored in, in things like tables that we call mm -hmm. matrices. And then in data, you're trying to understand the richness of uh, in data science, you're trying to understand the richness of, uh, of the data set that you have. And usually that means interrogating these matrices, you know, trying to find out what is uh, relevant information in this matrix, what is redundant information uh, in, in, in this matrix. And so you need to understand how to manipulate that. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and linear algebra basically helps you do that, right? So mm -hmm. you, you, can, you can look at a, at a, at a matrix as a, as a, um, a set of uh, columns or a set of rows and understanding how columns relate to each other, how rows relate to each other. So this is how a lot of people come in. And, and they want to do, for example, as I mentioned earlier, principal component analysis, which is really just a, a form of data mining. You know, where mm -hmm. is the relevant information in the data that I've, uh, that I've just stored? And you can translate that in a matrix uh, manipulation or an algorithm. And so I teach these base algorithms that allow you to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Other people come into linear algebra from, uh, for example, fluid mechanics or climate modeling or uh, seismic uh, analysis. And then matrices come up because they represent systems of equations. And, and mm -hmm. so, you know, maybe pe people who remember high school uh, algebra, you know, remember systems of equations, but there they were maybe two by two. So you had two equations and two unknowns. Uh, mm -hmm. But in many of the systems that I've worked with, you may have millions of equations and millions of unknowns, and you store them typically using matrices. And again, then you want to be, be able to manipulate these matrices to understand these systems a little bit better. Uh, so... You know, that's the interesting thing with linear algebra. I see this very much as the field that allows you to manipulate and work with matrices and vectors. And these matrices and vectors are used to store data, to represent systems, um, and, um, and therefore they come in so handy in many different places. Wow, fantastic. Makes I don't know if that makes sense, Kirill. Yeah. <laughs> it makes sense. It makes sense. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it's a great example. And it uh, reminds me of um, uh, the difference between R and Python, that R was designed originally to be very favorable to work with uh, vectors and matrices. Yeah. Whereas in Python, it, it feels like more like of, a, of an extra additional layer. And, and that explains why R is so popular in science, whereas Python... It, is more popular in like the among developer or data scientists who came from develop the development world. Yes, and and of course now you know we see also a lot of students that come in from um, from other areas of science using MATLAB, mm. which stands for Matrix Laboratory for that same mm. reason, right? And Cleve Moeller and 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 other people started uh, MATLAB because they they understood that matrices are the sort of the building blocks of so much of science. And so if you develop an architecture, software architecture or a platform that allows easy manipulation with matrices, then you're on uh, onto something. And, and yeah. basically R is, is based on that same philosophy. Uh, yeah. But I see a lot of the students, uh, you know, of course, uh, liking Python, uh, particularly because of the visualization aspect of it. I mm. think that's often what they say. And also Julia. I don't know if you've played with Julia, but that's becoming really popular now too. I, I haven't played myself, but I've heard it is picking up quite a bit. Yeah, I haven't myself either. We we yeah. offer an introduction to Julia course, and I took that once. Mm -hmm. But I've, no, I let my students program in this. I do very <laughs> little programming myself anymore. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Um, 
you mentioned principle component analysis. I would love if you could explain uh, to our uh, listeners and to me, frankly, uh, what it is like just just intuitively. What is principle component analysis, and and uh, how can somebody just think about it to understand it better? Yeah, that's a. Ooh, let, let me see if I can do this. So the name sort of gives it away, mm -hmm. right? The name sort of says, "What is the the what are the principal components?" In other way, in other words, what are the principal pieces of information mm -hmm. that you have available to you? So suppose that you're storing, you know, you're you're um, you're storing a lot of data. Uh, you know, let me uh, let me say that at every second in time, just as an example, you're storing uh, temperature data across the state of California. Okay, mm -hmm. so or, or every hour, and and uh, for for every slice of that in time, so every hour or every second, you have all this temperature data, and you put them in one big vector. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you you just put them in 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 sort of one column of a table. Okay. And so now you're building this table for a whole year. Uh, every column represents a temperature distribution in California at a particular time. And then you start to wonder, hey, what is sort of common about this temperature distribution? So now I've got, I don't know how many different columns. Every column is a temperature distribution. But do they have a lot in common? Mm -hmm. right? So these columns, is there, are there maybe some columns that are representative of the general type of, of distribution that I see. Mm -hmm. In other words, where, where does the principal content or information of this table really sit? Can mm -hmm. I say, hey, you know what? I don't have to store that whole table. If I save columns 11 and 340 and, uh, and 2057, then those three columns contain really the most important information. They can be used to represent the temperature distribution over the year, because you know what, from day to day, maybe some of this changes, but there may be three sort of uh, temperature distributions that represent the, the yearly fluctuation of the temperature in California. Okay, so it makes sense that when you're collecting a whole lot of data, that there is a lot of redundancy in that data. Okay, mm -hmm. and so then you start saying, okay, if there's a lot of redundancy in data, where are the principal pieces of information? Where do mm -hmm. they sit? So in principal component analysis, that's what you're really trying to do. You're trying to distill, extract, what are the most important pieces of information that if people said, okay, you got this huge uh, amount of data, but you know which pieces are really representative of the whole mm -hmm. for the most part you know, of course you're missing details right there are always mm -hmm. exceptions mm -hmm. there are always outliers but but in say for 95 percent you want to represent this data reasonably well how much information would you need to keep to represent mm -hmm. most of the behavior that you're seeing that would be principal component analysis wow right? that is a beautiful explanation yeah loved it okay. well now <laughs> fantastic so then, so then, you you know, in, in, in this example that I gave you with the columns, finding out which columns you need to keep to be able to represent the data well, that would be PCA or in linear algebra, we call it singular value decomposition, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, yeah, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful uh, way to look at, it, you know, one, wonderful algorithm to have. And yeah. I grew up at, at Stanford, I did my PhD at Stanford in the group that had the guru of that principal component analysis. Wow. He, we call him the god of matrix computations. His name was Gene Golub. He came from Russia, or a Russian background, right? I think. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, Golub. Golub. Yeah, 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 yeah. Golub. Yeah. Doesn't it mean dove? Does it mean dove? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it means yeah. a, a pigeon. Oh, pigeon. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Anyway, so, so Gene Golub. And um, so his ancestry was from, from Russia. I think he was born in the United States. But anyway, he was, he was this unbelievable uh, uh, scientist and, uh, and engineer uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in matrix computation was his uh, bread and butter. 
And he was the one who really created uh, the efficient way to compute this singular value decomposition or PCA. And on his license plate on his car, when we were students, Mm. he had a license plate that said Prof SVD, singular value Uh, decomposition. (laughs) So I'm a big fan of that algorithm. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for explaining it well. Uh, I guess an an analogy uh, would be uh, like if you have a book, you don't want to read the whole book. You just read the summary of a book, right? Instead of 200 pages, you read That's two. right. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And a lot of uh, people make use of that, right? So they're just sort of making use of the principal component analysis <laughs> <laughs> of these okay. difficult novels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. There's even an app. Uh, uh, I think it's called Blinkist. Uh, I, it's an app that you can download like summaries of books, like any book they summarize and you just read the summary if you don't have time. Yeah. And it's a wonderful area of research also, right? So, so mm. think, okay, if I had any text, can you yeah, automate yeah. the uh, retrieval, if you want, yeah. of the most important uh, pieces of this plot, right? The, yes. you know, that, 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 is a, that is an incredibly difficult thing to do, of course, but uh, so that was fascinating research, yeah. Yeah, well, I think we're getting there slowly with all the transformers and different types of neural uh, architectures or NLP algorithms. So we'll get there, I think. Yeah, yeah. That that, that natural language uh, processing is a wonderful area of research. Yeah. Yeah. So one more thing on PCA. Is my understanding correct that it doesn't have to be like identical data like temperature in these columns? For instance, it could be uh, the data of a store and we could have uh, geodemographic data about our customers, their purchasing habits, you know, what what items they like, all of this, just random, randomly different types of columns. Um, basically, we could just normalize them and then apply PCA anyway. Is that is that correct? Yes. And then what you often find is that you extract a bit of information from all of these different dimensions, mm-hmm. right? So if you have all yeah. the all of these different uh, uh, descri- descriptors, as you say, represented in the data, then then when you start looking at this, you probably extract a bit of of everything. Right, because uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and that and that helps. Uh, that helps um, when you build your model, whether it's a logistic regression or a deep learning neural network. It helps you limit the amount of inputs you give it, so it speeds up the training and uh, just makes it more efficient that way. That's that's ab- absolutely one of the one of the ways that you can use it. You know, you could just do data mining, right, where you're only interested or prim- primarily interested in in uh, the uh, the richness of the uh, the contents that you have. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, it, it really trying to explore the data, what's really in it, what's not in it. You know, what what are the like I said, the the principal um, behaviors that I'm that I'm seeing here, the principal components. Mm-hmm. But you can also use it uh, as a as a an assistance in other algorithms, and that's often, as you say, yeah, uh, really well well said to speed up uh, other algorithms. Because you can mm-hmm. imagine when you're doing a you know you're creating a deep learning algorithm, and you have a, an enormous amount of data to train this. Well, you really only need to train it on relevant data, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have repeated data. Uh, a lot of redundancy in the data. Well, that would be really nice if you understand where that redundancy is so you don't need to train on the same thing over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Margot, thank you very much for the description of PCA. That was, I think, the first time uh, described so well on the podcast. So that'll be very useful. So you're testing testing all your guests and saying, (laughs) explain to me what is PCA. (laughs) No, no, no. I, I, I look... I ask for the 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 you know something that feels right at the moment, um, but what I wanted to say is that it, now we've learned a bit about your you know travel history and uh, your teaching, and so when you're not being a mom and when you're not teaching at Stanford, you're the co-founder and co-director of WIDS or Women in Data Science, which is a huge conference. How do you find the time? Like this sounds already like a lot of things. How can you, in addition to all that, also be running a massive world renowned conference? I think you've reached over a hundred thousand people worldwide with in sixty different countries. How do you find the time for all this? Yeah, so uh, uh, you know the secret is uh, a really, really good team, right? Mm-hmm. 
and delegation, delegation, delegation. And <laughs> so with women in data science uh, uh, was formed almost, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it was sort of mir a, a miracle really how that came, came together. We never set out uh, with WITS to build this huge global conference, nor did I ever dream that this would become so, so big. Uh, but uh, here's what happened in 2015. I got really sick and tired of having conference after conference in data science. And, and when I talk about data science, when we talk about data science in WITS, we see data science as this umbrella field that contains artificial intelligence and machine learning and data visualization and everything, right? And, and, and there is not a common shared uh, vocabulary. And so some, some people see data science as totally separate from AI, okay? So, so let me just make clear that we see ourselves as a container for, for everything related to data, including AI. Uh, but at that time in, in what I would call the, data, this, the field of data science, you know, most conferences, uh, particularly in Silicon Valley, I have to say, were, were totally male dominated. We had so many conferences that only had male speakers. And I knew as a woman in this field myself, so many outstanding women doing really fantastic stuff. And I didn't see them um, uh, as, uh, as speakers at conferences or on panels. Uh, we have these so-called manals, right? With the male only, <laughs> uh, male only panels. And, and so that's I not heard the, that before. No, the manals. Oh, yeah, this is a common, common theme. So, so I got really sick and tired of it. And, and for me, the last straw was a, a conference that was actually organized, I have to, I have to uh, admit, uh, on campus. And I had been asked to, to talk, and I couldn't make it uh, to, on that day. And uh, a little bit later, I saw the announcement of the conference and I saw there were only really male plenary speakers. And so I ran into one of the organizers and they said, what happened? He said, well, Marco, you couldn't make it. He said, are you, <laughs> are you kidding me? I'm the only woman. Uh, I said, no, well, Fei Fei couldn't make it either. I'm talking about Fei Fei Lee here, very famous uh, AI uh, person on, on campus. And she's a wonderful colleague. Um, and, and we couldn't, we really looked for other women, but we couldn't find any. And I thought, okay, that's the problem, right? They're just not known. Uh, they're out there. They're not being promoted for whatever reason. Let's make a, let, let's change this once and for all. Let's organize a conference that is a technical conference and just happens to have only female speakers. Like so many conferences at the time happened to have only male speakers, right? Mm -hmm. And so I jokingly said uh, the first conference we held when people said, why do you only have female speakers? I said, well, Joe couldn't make it. No, we, <laughs> we asked him, but he couldn't make it. And, and you know, it. and we really tried to find male speakers, but we just couldn't find any, right? <laughs> uh, so we, we started this and, and we, of course, invited men and women to come, but to our huge surprise, we hit such a nerve. And, and, and within a couple of weeks at the time for our first conference, we were sold out. And, and then the next year we thought, well, maybe we should have this in, in more places, not just have a Stanford conference because we were, uh, of course, limited the number of participants. We ended up, uh, just because uh, we thought that maybe a fun thing to try, live streaming at that time. So this is pre-COVID, right, 2015. Mm -hmm. Live streaming was not so, so common uh, for conferences, and uh, and without you were the pioneers. Well, we just tried it, so you know, and it, of course, people had done some of it, but yeah. we we started live streaming and we we made it available to everybody for free, and and to our big surprise, we had six thousand people on the live stream without advertising. Wow. So, so to us, uh, Kirill at the time, it meant well, we hit, we're hitting a nerve, people. And particularly women and, and, and young girls, they really want to see uh, other women talking about this amazing work that they're doing. And this was not a conference where we got together to complain uh, about how hard it was for a woman in data science. This was a conference celebrating this really outstanding work done by all these amazing women. And so we thought, well, how can we scale this up? And Grace Hopper is a conference organized uh, for, for girls and women right in, in, in STEM. 
And we thought, well, we could do another Grace Hopper. We would just go to a big convention center and get thousands of people to come. But to me, that didn't make any sense. And I thought, well, why why don't we use the live stream and make our lives a little bit simpler? Because as you're saying, if you have a really big conference, it's an unbelievable logistical nightmare. And it costs a lot of time. So we were thinking, uh, instead of building a huge conference locally, let's uh, distribute this conference. Uh, We offer our live stream to anybody in the world who wants to use it. But around our live stream, they can build a local conference. And so my thought was, well, somebody in Texas could start a WITS conference they could maybe chime in to the WITS conference, you know, dial into it uh, from the live stream for a couple of the talks that we provide. And then the rest of the day, they can have their local speakers. So Mm -hmm. we sort of spread the love a little bit more, right? And then the ambassadors would be responsible for their own little conference, and we would not be. The only Uh thing that we would do for the ambassadors, they say, here's the the general way that that you can build a conference like this. Here's our live stream. Here's a logo. Uh, here is a website, we can help you with registration. So that's that's the only thing we really offer. And that was for us a low cost, low effort way to, to scale up this conference. And the other nice thing, of course, is you're giving your ambassadors a lot of ownership, right? So, mm. so they can build their own. And this just worked so well. So now we have over 500 ambassadors all around wow. the world, you know, and, and like you said, in over 60 countries. Mm. And uh, if we hadn't had COVID, we probably would have had around 250 or 300 WITS conferences around the world. And even mm. with COVID happening, we had our we had our Stanford conference on March 2nd. And two mm-hmm. days later, uh, Stanford did not allow big conferences anymore. So, wow. you know, we, we were even thinking at the time, should we... Should we just cancel uh, Stanford yeah. WIDS? Um, and in hindsight, maybe that would have been better. Uh, I've always been worried about WIDS having actually been one of these conferences that helped spread uh, COVID more. Uh, yeah. We weren't we weren't as knowledgeable, I think, about uh, about COVID uh, very early on in March as we are now. But anyway, we, we, we still did it this year, but many of our conferences happen a bit later in the year, and they either went to uh, fully virtual conferences or they canceled and they will do them, them next year. Uh-huh. But so we, so we created in 2016 and 17 this sort of hybrid form of mm-hmm. live stream, virtual conference, and then regional live events and now a lot of uh, also regional virtual events and um, what has been so amazing to me is to see this being picked up in countries that you may not expect we're really big in the middle east Mm. Um, in saudi arabia we were uh, i think the very first conference that women could go to unaccompanied because they were only women at the conference wow so this is interesting in japan uh, this was the first time women really got together for a conference in, in this sort of computational area. Um, you know, we, we have them in Africa, we have them everywhere, but Antarctica, right? So we should, <laughs> we should work on that. Yeah. <laughs> we That's should have so a, lovely. Yeah. So That's it's so been, lovely. it's been really surprising success and we're still a very small team. We, we are yeah. three, three co-directors and, uh, we have a really small budget, uh, actually, to run this, uh, uh, but we we're we're really making great use of this amazing work done by these hundreds of volunteers around the world. So uh, it's it's been so surprising to me. I That's awesome. It. Yeah. When when is the next one, and how can somebody participate? So the next one will be International Women's Day 2021. So mm-hmm. and then we are actually going to have a 24 hour event around the world so it will be a a 24-hour marathon where we start in the asia pacific so we'll we'll kick it off in new zealand uh this conference and then we travel around the world so we go uh to uh you know so we have the asia pacific and china and india then we go to europe and the middle east then we go to the americas and then we end up with uh, live streaming from uh, hawaii and uh, yeah so that's a really i think starting in new zealand and ending in hawaii is uh, is is, is really fun 
Um, and then, so we're going through these different regions in the world and we'll have content delivered uh, from Stanford for 24 yeah. hours. But that content will be supplemented by content in each of these different regions from uh -huh. some of the regional events. Amazing. So, yeah, it, it will be a really fun thing to uh, to do. And like you said, this last year, we had uh, over 100,000 people participating in, wow. in the WITS conferences. And uh, uh, yeah, the nice thing also about it is because most of the conferences, the WITS conferences, they, they, uh, they are recorded. And so we have hundreds and hundreds of videos of women talking about their work right now. So yeah, uh, it's uh, it's made a difference. But we don't just do the conference. We also now have a podcast uh, yes. that that I'm what is hosting. It called? Uh, well, we are incredibly creative, so we call it the <laughs> the Wits Podcast. <laughs> okay, so it's really just called the Women in Data Science Podcast, and uh -huh. uh, we also have a datathon that we're running oh, wow. a, a global datathon for a couple of months before uh, our WITS conference at Stanford. And then at this Stanford Central Conference, uh, we will uh, we always announce the winners. So okay. last year we have uh, we had uh, several hundred teams from, from around the world working on this datathon. Yeah, and, wow. and we have a bit of an outreach program now too mm. uh, to, mm. uh, to high school uh, students. So we're, gro we're growing. Uh, Amazing. We want, we want to do more, but it's still really the three of us running this so we yeah. uh, we try to grow it pretty slowly yeah wow wow that's that's fantastic um what are the main messages you aim to spread with this conference so you know we started because we really really wanted to promote these fantastic women doing this really great work um, but we always say, hey, we aim to support, inspire, and educate. So those are sort of the three active uh, action verbs, if you like, the action yeah. words for us. Um, one of the big things we hope is that some of the barriers to participation by women, and we're really very inclusive. So when I say uh, women, you know, anybody really is, is welcome. Uh, anybody who identifies as a woman, anybody who, uh, anybody of any gender, any background, of course, can participate in our datathon, can participate in uh, by by going to our conferences and so on. Uh, but we really like to uh, make people see that there is no reason uh, for for anyone not to enter this field. That you don't have to fit a certain profile to be successful in this field. And the reason I'm emphasizing this, Kirill, is that I've seen over the, the, the three decades now or so that I've been in the field of computational sciences, there are so many women uh, or people from, from a, a different cultural background who somehow feel that because they do not fit the stereotype data scientist or the stereotype computer scientist or the stereotype mathematical uh, mathematician that they will not be successful and they don't have what it takes. And that's so sad because there is an enormous amount of talent out there. And we'd like to break down those barriers for, for, for people from other countries, from people from other genders, from other racial backgrounds. Um, and so that's really the, my main motivation for doing this. Mm. Uh, here's one thing that I hear a lot, you know, for years teaching also, uh, in many places around the world, I've heard, uh, young female students say, uh, I'm just not good enough, uh, in mathematics or in computing, uh, or in statistics or in general technical field to really make it in this world, to be successful. However, you define success. Uh, to be able to contribute. I'm just not good enough. And then you ask them, why do you say this? And they say, well, you know, I, uh, uh, that's, that's how I feel. That's, that's what I've been told. Um, I see uh, young, uh, I see boys or young men around me, uh, ahead of me. I feel they have this innate ability. I don't think I have this innate ability. And so that's one big myth that you have to have this really strong innate ability to be successful. 
Uh, and and that's not true. You know, you innate ability helps. You know, it it, it is certainly helpful, but it is not necessary. Mm. Uh, and and a lot of people who believe in that they um, they feel that the first time they don't do so well in the course means that they will just never be successful. Uh, but if you believe in a growth mindset and if you just stick with it for a bit, you often break through and you grow <laughs> uh, in in this and 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 you can reach uh, on a level of understanding that's very high. Uh, but unfortunately, if you have these fields where people say only with an innate ability can you be successful, and by the way, math and computing and data science is not the only field. The same thing happens in finance. And business to some extent, the same thing happens in philosophy. There mm -hmm. is this notion that you need to have innate ability. And you combine this with the stereotype threat, as uh, Claude Steele, one of my colleagues at Stanford, uh, names it, that men have this innate ability a lot more than women. Then you're creating barriers to entry for women that are just um, unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm really hoping that this conference shows people that there's so many women that you can see there that are successful, that that young women and, and, and uh, girls and also women that are in the field and still feel like a little bit of an imposter uh, say, hey, there is absolutely no reason for me to fear this. There's so many examples of women that that are really good. I can be that way, too. Whether you come from a math background or a stats background or come from the social sciences or the humanities or from, from the field of medicine or, or law or earth sciences or, or biology, it, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, can, you can become uh, a great contributor to this, to this field. And here's the other reason why I'm so um, gang-ho on this. Data science, as you know very well, has become so critical. You know, many, many decisions that we're making in the world right now, be it political, be it economical, be it technological, many decisions are data-based now, right? So it's data-driven decision-making. And so that means that right now we're setting the stage through data analysis for the future. And if you do not have a good representation of the population around the table making those decisions, doing these sort of analysis, you're really missing out. You know, that's not good. So first of all, I would really like to see a much higher percentage uh, of the people making those decisions be women. I'd like to see a much higher percentage come from different countries. It would be crazy to have companies in Silicon Valley really determine the trends of the future, now in so many different ways. It is crazy to have a company like Google, which is founded on a certain culture, make decisions for our internet-based life, uh, decisions that involve ethics uh, and, and ideas of fairness on this Western, you know, with this Western culture only for the whole world. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that it's... that. To me, it's totally crazy. So this needs to be democratized in the sense that it needs to be globalized. Mm -hmm. and, and we need people from all sort of backgrounds around this table. So that's, that's um, yeah. and I'm very, I may sound a bit that way too, <laughs> but I'm a little frustrated that after decades of being in this field myself, so little has changed. Mm. Why is that? Why has so little changed? I think because of these persisting myths. Mm -hmm. When I was a young uh, student in high school, I was one of the very few girls in my high school choosing math, choosing physics and chemistry. You know, I was often, you know, one of two girls maybe. Mm. And then I went to university and there, and there was one, again one of two girls and often the only girl in some of the classes. And when I asked female friends of mine, why are you not also a mathematician or why are you not going into computer science? They would say, ah, I just don't have what it takes. That same barrier is there now. Still, we see girls in middle school and high school say, I'm just not good enough. 
And I think this is just persisting because we allow it to be. Mm. We still have the stereotype threat. There are still teachers who believe this, actually. There's still there's still um, so many role models for girls who 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 say this. I I was when my son was in elementary school, I went uh, as a guest to one of his little math classes to talk mm-hmm. about pi, you know. Mm-hmm. This, amazing number pi and so he was talking to these eight or nine year olds about pi and i already saw at that stage that there were many more boys paying attention than girls Mm -hmm. and in the advanced math class a year later there's only five girls out of 25 Mm -hmm. at the age of nine there's absolutely no reason for that. The girls mm. are very good at, at, at mathematics and there's no absolutely no evidence that they're not as good as the boys. But it was already starting at that time, mm. this idea that boys are just better and faster. Than, mm. and do, you, do, you th- do you think uh, there's um, a preference, like girls maybe not uh, as many girls want to be in mathematics? Or do you think it's uh, mostly about the... Uh, preconceived uh, myths that they have you know i think this this um uh, first of all i have to be really humble here because i i just talk from my own experiences right mm. and so obviously i'm i'm probably a little biased in this but this is what i think i think that this these two myths i talked about this This feeling that society has as a whole, that you must have this innate ability to be successful, the feeling that men have this more than women, uh, is incredibly important. And then on top of this, I think a lot of girls and young women are, and this may also be cultural, this may have nothing to do with genetics or, or, you know, um, really, really uh, original female versus male traits. But but we see a lot of girls and young women be very motivated to contribute to the social good, to mm. do good. And there is this also misconception, I think, that uh, the STEM fields and uh, data science and computer science are dry and removed from reality maybe not so practical and not used for the common good, Mm. which of course is also totally false. But, Mm -hmm. but people think about, you know, when we go to high schools, we see this, for example, that a lot of the girls say, why would I want to work for Google? They're only doing, you know, they're creating apps or they're so far removed from uh, what really benefits society. Mm. So I think that also plays a role. Um, I, like if, a third yeah, I think so. And it's always hard right? because people argue and say, well, when you look at nursing, uh, there are very few men doing that. Are you up in arms about the, the lack of men in nursing? You know, mm. as much as you are up in arms about the lack of women in data. And I, th- I think it's there. I think men would be fantastic nurses and we, I'd love to see more, more of them. That's not my field. So I'm not up, in, up on the barricades <laughs> for, for men in nursing, but I think in general society benefits when people that are at the forefront of any movement, be it healthcare or uh, data-driven decision-making uh, have a, have a very balanced uh, demographics. I think that is to the benefit of society uh, all along. It's the same with first responders. You know, that's why it's better to have more women in, in the fire service, the more women in the police force, mm-hmm. um, you know, more women sort of, certainly with policymakers, you know, all, for all of that, for all of those reasons, it's good to be, be balanced. Whenever you have people making decisions for future generations, um, mm-hmm. So I think in this, it, it behooves us to really try to dispel these myths. And only if we've done that and we still see females choosing those, uh, those other fields much more, can we probably say, hey, there is something innate 
to mm-hmm. women or men that makes them go this way or, or another. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, it may very well be, yes, that women say, I just don't want to be in this field. But is that because they don't like the work or is that because they don't like the male-dominated culture? Mm. Gotcha. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, you're clearly doing your part uh, to help with this problem. You're um, spreading the word on your podcast, on guest podcasts like this one on uh, in your conference. What can individuals do, whether uh, regardless of gender, regardless of age and background, just somebody listening to this podcast, what, is, what would your call to action be to this person to help um, encourage more women uh, into the space of data science? Well, if you're a woman listening and and, <laughs> and any of this, you think, oh, yeah, I have a little bit of that too. Please uh, challenge your own um, uh, misconceptions. I mean, I know this sounds very judgmental, but if, if you're a woman and you think, you know, uh, you have, have these thoughts of I may be not, not simply not be good enough, I may not have what it takes Start challenging yourself a little bit and say, what evidence do, I actually, do you actually have for this? Start um, uh, turning this around. Most of the time for, for women and others, it's because they found some setbacks or they've, they felt that they failed a couple of times or they're slow on the uptake or they felt a little bit out of their depth and it makes them feel uncomfortable and, it, and they see this as a sign of not belonging. But really, all it is, is that you're on a learning curve. And when this is the this is the thing that I did for myself many years ago, when you start really loving that feeling, hey, I'm I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. I'm feeling like I'm I don't quite yet have what it takes. I'm still learning. Don't compare yourself to others who are a little bit further on this learning curve. But just think about how wonderful it is that you are learning and growing and embrace that and seek that out even more and know and get the confidence that you will learn and you will get better. And this is so beautifully captured in this notion of a growth mindset. And uh, at the very start of, uh, you know, before we started the podcast, you asked me, what's my favorite book? Um, Here is a book that I think is phenomenal for this, and that's the book Mindset by Carol Dweck. Uh, She is a colleague of mine at Stanford. Uh, Her last name is D-W-E-C-K. And this book, Mindset, has changed uh, the lives of many uh, young women that I've known and and also young men, because it's not just the women that sometimes feel like an imposter. (laughs) Mm -hmm. This this discomfort with learning uh, is in many people. There is this idea that when it comes to computing or maths, you have to get it instantly or you will never get it. And that's nonsense. You know, as an instructor, I see this people, even this, the people around you who seem to know it all, they have themselves also gone through this learning curve and they also make mistakes. And it may be a little bit of a culture in this field to not really admit to that too much. Um, Mm -hmm. But um, reading that book changes a lot of people's uh, uh, perceptions. And so I highly, highly recommend that. So, so, you know, challenge yourself. And, and, and if, if you, if you feel uncomfortable with, with not being on top of something yet, turn it around to say, how great I'm learning, I'm growing. And, and in itself, that becomes a goal. Uh, I'm at the stage now in my career that I'm actually a little uncomfortable with being too comfortable. <laughs> if, I under- if I understand everything and everything get- comes easy to me, that doesn't feel right because it doesn't. that means that I'm actually not learning all that much. Yeah, yeah. Makes uh, sense. And so here is another thing, you know, I always tell students as well that uh, what's an expert? You know, you strive to be an expert on something. You strive to be successful in something. You strive to be a leader in a field. So you want to be an expert. What is that? An expert is somebody who's made every possible mistake. Mm. 
So you can only become an expert if you make all those mistakes. Mm. Oh, makes sense. <laughs> so, that's a good you know, way so you got to learn and fail and learn from that and fail again and keep going and, and climbing up that big, steep learning curve. And, and in itself, that's, that's the wonder of learning. And so hopefully, uh, you know, that, that's what I'm hoping people would get out to say, hey, um, and yes, for some people, they're a bit rusty in mathematics when they enter this field. They may have never programmed this much. And these are skills that you, you have to do a lot of. You know, I, I sometimes do these boot camps for people and they say, hey, math and computing is just like sports, mm. right? You don't go and say, I want to run a marathon. Uh, oh, let's not train for a whole year and let's just go <laughs> and, and, and run a little bit. I should be able to do a marathon. It's the same with maths. You have to keep doing it. You have to maybe do it daily or a couple of times a week and have to keep training these muscles in your in your, in your brain, so to say, you know, and create these these connections in your brain and they need to be fresh and, and you need to constantly re replenish that and grow that and uh, and you get rusty. And this is another thing that happens with people. They haven't maybe done math for a while. Mm. And then they go take a course or they try to take a you know professional course in Python or, mm. or something else. And it doesn't come fast to them. Say, so, no, you're totally rusty. You need a WD-40 course. You, know? <laughs> you need to de-rust yourself a little bit. And what I always tell is just keep at it. Uh, it's just like starting running again after not having run for a year. It takes a while to get back into this and you have to do your mobility exercises and your stretching. And that's the same with your brain. And so just keep keep at it and, and keep keep feeding this and, and keep computing, keep trying to write code. And the more you do it, the more natural it will come for you and the, and the faster you will be. And compare it to compare it to sports. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. And anything in life, right? Like if you want to master your mind, it's not like you're going to uh, all of a sudden, um, you know, become the expert at meditation. You got to like meditate slowly, little by little over the course of weeks and months and years before you reach a level of, oh, calmness in the mind and, and you can control yeah. your, your thoughts. Like everything yeah. takes that. And, you know, this is something I've tried and I've always totally feel that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, totally. And um, yeah. I'm really envious of of people who who can who can do this and still their yeah. mind. I need to go on a bike ride or something to really still yeah. my mind. Yeah. Yeah. I need to be yeah. out of breath <laughs> to still <Yeah>. my mind. <laughs> yeah, everybody's got their own. Um, thank you. So uh, for those uh, of uh, our listeners who are women or who identifies women, one way. To, or the main way is to like question your beliefs and question oh, where, where is this belief coming from? Why am I not good? If if that belief exists in in, in uh, their mind, what can uh, men do? How can men support their female colleagues um, in in and encourage them to enter data science or to thrive in the space of data science? Yeah, that's such a good question. I think for. Uh... For men, what I've seen with my male colleagues would really help them. Uh, of course, there is this thing that, that you have to think about whether or not you have any biases in how you look at people. There's a lot of them. Some of them are mm -hmm. conscious. Some of them are unconscious. So you have to challenge yourself a little bit with, with that. Uh, look around you. See who you've been hiring. See if you've been promoting. Uh, it's very common for people to hire like people. You tend mm. to hire people a bit like yourself or the culture in your company. And so that perpetuates, right, this mm -hmm. thing. If you are in a company that's 85% or 90% men, it's more likely that men are hired. So, so challenge yourself a bit in that, saying, hey, am I just even subconsciously falling into that, into that trap? But the other thing is, I think, for men is to really understand that, there, that it is very different for for uh, uh, for a woman or somebody from uh, an underrepresented uh, minority to be in a male dominate the male dominated or white or Asian dominated because that's often the case in these fields uh, a group 
And a lot of men that I meet uh, don't acknowledge that. They say, ah, we're nice. You know, mm-hmm. we're, we're open. We're welcoming. You don't have to feel uh, different. So what I say to them is go to a women in data science conference. Mm-hmm. I have seen amongst fantastically supportive colleagues at Stanford a big change in their understanding of what it is like for women and therefore their dedication to uh, supporting women after they attended the Women in Data Science Conference and for the first time in their lives, they were the odd one out. Mm. See, for a lot of men in this field, they have never, never been in a group where they were different. Mm. They never had to think about it. And, and I just remember one of my male colleagues coming to the first WIDS. And at the time, we had 400 people at the conference in this big auditorium. And there were 19 men. Oh, wow. Plus or minus one. I forgot now. So I asked them all to the stand <laughs> plus up. Plus or minus Joe. <laughs> yeah, but plus or minus. Oh, Joe couldn't make it. That's right. <laughs> Joe wasn't there. Uh, and, you know, one of them said uh, that... Uh, he had to get up halfway through the conference to go to the bathroom. So he got up and he said, for the first time ever, I saw people look at me when I got up and left, walking through the crowd to go to the bathroom. Now, as a woman, in, when you're at the conference, and I've often been in that situation, when you get up and you stand out, literally, People focus on you, not because you're, you know, you're you're a model or you're 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 so good looking. That's not it. It's just simply because you're different. And oh, so hey, people, look, there, there's a woman at this conference. There's a woman. Wow, you know where where would she come from? And so now <laughs> it was women in data science. Hey, there is a man. And so this guy, this colleague of mine, said this is the first time, and that was the moment where it shifted in him. But he said, wow, uh, I've never felt this different. And it yeah. made him feel a little uncomfortable. And this was just, I said to him, you've just experienced this for eight hours. Mm. Right? Yeah. Most of my female colleagues my age, we've experienced this for 35 years. Wow. Right? And it still happens. And so that sort of awareness. So when you're, when you're a man, said, throw yourself in situations like this. Go to women in data science or go to, you know, a meetup for women in machine learning, for example. Go to a meeting by, with Pi ladies or our ladies. You know, yeah. there's so many, there's women in AI. Uh, there's so many events now. We're absolutely not the only one, right? There's so many yeah. opportunities for, for, for men to experience this also and open their minds to it. And then I would say for those of you listening in, who have, uh, 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 you know, who can hire and promote people, hire women, be open, hire Mm -hmm. people that do not look like you, Mm -hmm. you know, don't worry about it. Give them, uh, if you had any doubts, give them the benefit of the doubt, try them Mm -hmm. out and look at uh, these hundreds and thousands of women who've been speaking at women in data science conferences or, or, or pie ladies or, you know, like I said, all these other women who are amazing and, uh, and look to them as well. Look a little bit beyond uh, your normal field of view. Absolutely. And with your first story, I, I have also a story which uh, happened to me this year. Um, and uh, it's very, very like I, I completely agree with what you're saying. So, I will, my girlfriend and I were in uh, Buenos Aires uh, at the start. I think it was start of March, and that's exactly when coronavirus started. You know, like becoming uh, serious, and everybody started realizing, okay, this is uh, this is a big problem. And while we were there, the first like first couple of days was fine. You know, we we could go to a restaurant or anywhere. But then uh, they become like the official government. Uh, they didn't know what to do yet, uh, so there was no like instruction. But people started to catch on. Like if if they're tourists, they may have brought coronavirus because like you know Argentina was still okay, and we clearly look different to everybody there in Argentina, right? So 
we are walking around the street and everybody's looking at us like, whoa, you know, stay away from them. They might be, you know, might have coronavirus. And when we go into a, a, a coffee shop just for like lunch or for some coffee, uh, we would sit down and the owners would come and ask us all these questions like, why are you here? What you do? Eventually we got kicked out just because of the color of our skin, right? Kicked out. Nobody else asked anybody questions because they all look, uh, you know, uh, different. Uh, but we look, we stood out. And so when we'd go in, we'd get kicked out. And like in that moment, I realized, oh, this is what racism feels reverse, right? I have no problems with, with that situation because it's understandable. It's, it's like coronavirus, people are afraid, people are worried, so I don't have any hard feelings. But I can just imagine like if you live your whole life feeling that way, always being like looked differently at just because of the color of your skin, it's terrible feeling. And, and it took... For me, like in before, I intellectually understood it, but it took that experience to understand on an emotional level. It's a whole different level of understanding. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, how, I mean, we're both white. And uh, so I have the advantage of being a Caucasian woman in, in this field, which makes it easier for me. I know this much easier for me than, than uh, women or, you know, uh, different genders, you know, not non-males of any kind, uh, uh, and, and particularly from other types of background. So my 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 black female colleagues, my Hispanic colleagues, uh, uh, you know, the, it, it, my Muslim colleagues, you know, for for a lot of them, they have a double whammy or a triple mm -hmm. whammy, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I need to be really humble too. Have I have I uh, seen uh, sexism? Absolutely. And I've I've uh, experienced any level, you know, from from uh, just the microaggressions as we call it, to you know being ignored, to not being promoted, to being scrutinized more than than others. To being sexually harassed, uh, everything on the spectrum I've I've experienced, um, and that's not great. At the same time, though, because I'm I'm vacation, it's been easier for me. So yeah, this sort of challenge, right? To put yourself, uh, even though it is very limited, because you knew also it was only going to be temporary for you, mm -hmm. right? And it's the same with the men. They come to women in data science. They leave it. They're back in their own comfortable culture. Uh, but imagine being in that situation over and over again. Uh, but, you know, the first thing we can all do is to try to at least understand a little. And I would never claim I understand because I've been a woman in STEM. I understand what it, what it is to be a black woman or man in, in the United States, for example, I would could never claim that because I think that's at a different level altogether again. Um, I can leave my work and go home and be, you know, the normal. So I think it's really, really important for, for people who are not different to understand that. And I find that when you then understand even a little bit, empathy is created and people tend to be more open and, and more aware, because what is also really difficult for a lot of, let's just focus on women here, women in this male-dominated environment, is that it's always up to them to change. It's up to them to point this out. It's up to them to be part of diversity committees and so on. Um, and that is you know, what we would really like to see is that we have men taking responsibility and ownership for this. So here's another call to your listener. If you are in a company, for example, that wants to work on diversity, don't ask the women to do that for you. Mm -hmm. No, ask, give that ownership to the men. Send them to something like, uh, like <laughs> with and, and to, to give them a feeling for what it is. Uh, sure, ask advice from, from, from women, understand the literature in this, but take ownership. Mm -hmm. We have in some cases men, for example, now also stepping up and saying, I'm not going to be part of any manuals. Mm -hmm. If I'm asked to be on a panel at a conference and everybody on that panel is a man, I refuse. I refuse to speak as a man at a conference with only male plenary speakers. 
these things really make a difference. And I hear so often uh, people say, ah, but then you can't do this. That's reverse discrimination. That is, uh, you know, too far the other way. Why would we invite women just because they're women? Uh, and they said, we just have to hire the best, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. That's all. And if that happens to be all men, what's wrong with that? And then I say, challenge yourself a little bit on how you define the best. Mm -hmm. If by the best, you also mean the person you're most comfortable with, who well, looks most like you, who has the same sort of definition of best, who is maybe as aggressive or has the same sort of way of speaking or communicating, then you need to really challenge how you evaluate best here. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is what often often happens. And then if you want to hire or promote or get somebody to speak at your conference and you just can't find any, reach out to us. We've got <laughs> binders of women, right? As, as we said in the States. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's a little political joke, but we've got we've got many, many, many lists of and, and videos of amazing women. And so we can help you. We can help you with that. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Margot. Uh, this is very, very valuable. And unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up here because uh, we're short on time. But uh, I greatly appreciate the insights and your offer to help those, you know, like people uh, find the right speakers or right women. And definitely we'll be approaching you from our conference, Data Sense Go, to, to ask for some speakers. I think, uh, I think it's a great, uh, great noble cause that you're pursuing here. So thank you very much. Thanks, Kirill. It was really fun to chat with you. Awesome. Awesome. Before you go, where are the best places for our listeners to contact you or find out more about WIDS and follow your work? Ah, so uh, send, you can send me an email. I'm super easy to find. Uh, to find me, all you have to do is Google Margot with a T, M-A-R-G-O-T, Stanford, and mm -hmm. they will find me. They'll find my email address. They can always uh, email me and I will respond. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm also on Twitter and, and Facebook a little bit, but uh, I do, I'm not as active as I, as I maybe should be uh, on those sort of platforms, but the email is the easiest. Okay. Is it okay to connect on LinkedIn as well? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Anybody who wants to connect, to send me an invite. Uh, send me a little message with it as well. I tend to respond to LinkedIn more, mostly if uh, people have a personal message and a reason for to connect with me. Yeah. But if you say you listen to uh, Kirill's uh, podcast <laughs> show, I will connect with you. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, uh, WIDS, what's the website for WIDS? Uh, WIDSconference.org, W-I-D-S conference, one word, dot org. And again, you, they can just Google women in data science, Stanford, and, and I'm sure they will find it then too. Amazing. And the next, the closest one you said is what, March 2021? March 2021. International awesome. Women's Day, March 8th, 2021 March 8th. is going to be the WITS at Stanford and uh, the 24-hour WITS event. Amazing. Amazing. Well, again, Margot, thank you very much. It's been a huge pleasure speaking with you today. Yeah, thanks very much, Kirill. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in today. Hope you enjoyed this podcast with Margot and got some valuable insights. My favorite part, I had two favorite parts. My first favorite part was about principal component analysis. What a beautiful explanation Margot provided. That was extremely powerful and valuable and also very just clear. And my second favorite part was that notion uh, of being on the other side of uh, racism or sexism or being in the minority, how it feels is different to how we think it feels. So uh, if uh, you have never experienced that feeling, then as Margot recommended, try to put yourself in an environment where you are the minority, where you will feel on an emotional level what it's like to be different, to be the odd one out. So try that out for yourself and uh, perhaps that will help you even more to inspire others and help them thrive in the space regardless of their background, regardless of their gender, 
um, and any any other factors that really don't and shouldn't matter. So there we go. That was our podcast with Margot. And uh, as usual, you can find the show notes at superdatascience.com slash 407. That's superdatascience.com 407. There you'll find a, a URL to Margot's LinkedIn, a URL for Women in Data Science Conference, and any materials we mentioned on the show, as well as the transcript for the episode. And one final call to action, if you know any woman or anybody who identifies as a woman, or in, as a matter of fact, anybody who could benefit from this episode to help make data science more diverse, more inclusive, and more empowering to everybody, then send them this episode. Send them, it's uh, very easy to share. Send them the link, uh, superdatascience.com slash 407. So spread the love and let's make data science an amazing place to be. And thank you again to Margo for joining us for this podcast. And thank you for tuning in today. I look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, happy analyzing.